So it's at the top. Great. Tom, whenever you're ready. Uh, no you problem. Can... Yes, no, no problem, Stella. And um, well, hello and good afternoon to everybody. And thank you very much for um, giving us the opportunity to, to, to talk this afternoon. It's, um, it's, very, it's very kind of you. Um, I should explain that I, 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 I know Stella um, uh, from my, my time with the, the University of Edinburgh last year. And, and so it's lovely to, 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 to see you again, Stella, and, and to get a chance to meet some of you this afternoon. And as I say, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. But I, I would like to start off with a couple of caveats, actually. One of them is this. Um, I'm not actually working as an EAL, in English as an additional language teacher at the moment, as I think that Stella indicated. And although I'm going to introduce the, this afternoon's presentation and talk a little tiny bit about, uh, you know, the background of what EAL is and, 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 and how we all work and that sort of thing, um, I, I defer to my colleagues, um, Sarah, Jane and Sylvia, who are far, far more up to date in terms of current uh, teaching practice in terms of EAL and who are actually working with the AL pupils in Aberdeenshire. Um, so I just want to say that. Um, <clears throat> and also, although I've given my dog a, a quick walk, he's lying beside me and, and he might get fed up and he might start barking. So that just if, there, if there's a barking sound, just to be clear, that's, that's not me, that's the dog. <laughs> OK, um, so yeah, so my, my, myself and my colleagues here, um, we've been working in additional support needs and supporting pupils up here in Aberdeenshire in the northeast of Scotland for a number of years. Um, and in fact, Sarah Jane, who you'll hear later on, and myself, we were actually the, 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 the first couple of teachers up in this area to try to put a, a provision into place um, for uh, children from other countries who were needing support with, with their English language learning. Um, but it's quite interesting to think about the fact that, um, you know, Scotland is a, is, a, is a fairly small country in the world, isn't it? And yet, um, you know, it's very different uh, depending on which area you live and work in. Um, and the reason I say that is um, that I thought you might be interested to hear a, a little tiny bit about the kind of numbers of these pupils who, are, who need this, the support in schools, for example. Um, uh, so, for example, um, there are about, well, there are over 700,000 uh, pupils in Scotland, nearly 800,000 actually um, in total. And about a third of those, you know, so, um, you know, a, a, a quarter of a million or so um, have got some sort of recorded additional support need and, and, and you know, require support for that. Um, and um, of those, about 6.1% have EAL or English as an, additional, as an additional language. So according to the website that I checked, and it is a, a Scottish government website, there is something like 14,000 uh, EAL pupils across Scotland. So it's a very big number of pupils um, who've, you know, either, you know, um, come from other countries because of, um, you know, uh, war or economic pressures or who have grown up in this country, but who uh, whose families use another language at home. There can be lots and lots of reasons um, for, for their, their, their in additional language backgrounds. Um, <clears throat> but it's quite interesting because Aberdeenshire and along, alongside many other parts of Scotland, there's obviously a very rural area. Um, it's a very scattered area, so pupils are very scattered. Communities can be quite isolated. Um, and, um, you know, but even here, and Sarah Jane and Sylvia will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think even here there are some 2,000 pupils with English as an additional, additional language in the school system. So it's a big, big number. Um, and again, I, I'll be corrected by my colleagues, but when I when I worked directly in the AL service, that meant that a small team of teachers, maybe uh, Sarah Jane was about 10 or 12 of us in the, in the early days, or maybe even fewer. We were traveling around the whole of the, a very large area of Scotland to try to, you know, visit and meet the needs of many of these pupils. And of course, you know, from a logistical point of view, that's it's just not possible to sort of see everybody and give them the amount of time that they need. But if you contrast that with Glasgow, with the city of Glasgow, and I'm sure that some of the listeners here are, are in the central belt in Edinburgh or Glasgow. In Glasgow, nearly a quarter, almost a quarter of the pupils in the school system have English as, as an additional language. So it's really quite a large number, um, a large part of that population. So you can imagine just, just how many pupils there are, are in need of support. But there in Glasgow, 
the EAL service is much larger as well. It's well over 100 staff. I did a presentation with a colleague to, to the uh, Glasgow EAL staff last year. So, you know, it, it's interesting to think about numbers, isn't it? I think, you know, um, uh, some of them, as I say, scattered across big rural areas of Scotland, even the islands and so on, and some of them more concentrated in, in, in urban areas and how, you know, their, their, their needs are different, their support systems are, are different and that sort of thing as a result. So I think that's one that's one one interesting thing just sort of start to introduce stuff a little bit. Um, another one um, is the one that I sort of always um, try and talk about a little bit, which is, OK, you've got X numbers of pupils with an addition uh, uh, with an additional language in whichever local authority it might be. Um, <clears throat> and they have their their, you know, their learning needs connected with English. But one of my studies was always involved with, well, what about their other needs as well? because you know a, a considerable percentage of these pupils must have dyslexia by definition you know a percentage of every population will have dyslexia some sort of difficulty with reading and writing uh, a certain percentage of, of any population is going to have autism um, uh, or another condition uh, in addition to learning this new language and being in a new country possibly and all that all that, that goes along with that but of course the people who are, are working with them may only see the difficulty with the English language that the, that the child faces and they may not see these all these other potential com conditions that can be part of their uh, learning makeup if you like so I always think that's very important to say that um, to anybody you know in academic circles like yourselves or anybody in professional circles working in schools to be aware of that fact because you know and I would be as guilty as this this as anybody meeting someone who is is, is 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 just getting to grips with the English language, the assumption is always that any you know challenges they're facing are due to the language alone, but it could be many other factors as well. Um, there are lots of other things I can talk about, but as, as I say, Sarah Jane and Sylvia can talk about them with much more authority. Um, there are things like the strategies that, 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 that are used in classroom to support the pupils. You know, the idea of immersion in an English language speaking environment but not an environment where everybody is quiet and, 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 and doesn't interact and doesn't engage. But, you know, these these very stimulating environments where you've got perhaps a, a couple of um, buddies uh, set up from from the local pupil, local pupil population who will provide good language models and will, will be a good stimulus to helping the young person to develop their English language skills rather than obviously some sort of quiet environment where there isn't that that stimulus and that's certainly a big part of the kind of support advice that um that sylvia and sarah jane and myself would would, would always have, have, have started to bring to bring to schools um lots of other things as well sources of support um in terms of uh, national organizations which can provide support there are two the scottish english as an additional, uh, english as an additional language coordinating committee and SATIL, the Scottish Association for Teaching English as an Additional Language. These are bodies which have representatives all across Scotland, comprising of EAL teachers working in the system and sharing information, sharing resources um, and providing a, you know, a, a support network to teachers like ourselves. And, and I'm sure Sarah Jane and Sylvia will, will agree that, you know, when you're working as we do in, in fairly remote rural areas, it's, it's good to have to be aware of these support networks that are out there. There are, um, you know, academic support networks as well, um, and there are academic studies which are to do with supporting um, these young people in schools. And I was involved in one for six months last year, as I said, with the University of Edinburgh. That's how I got to know Sylvia, uh, Stella, and and some other members of SCRA. And um, you know, I learned a little bit about some of the um, academic work that's going on to try and support these pupils too. So there are a lot of different um, aspects to EAL and or all the, all the different sort of sides of it, really. Um, you know, uh, and although I haven't been working directly in EAL for quite a long time, I have been working with EAL pupils. And that's where a couple of my, my case studies that I'm going to talk about in a minute will, will, will come in. Um, but, um, you know, in, in the secondary school, like, as, like the one I work in, um, although I'm part of the, the, the additional support needs uh, facility, supporting lots of different pupils and lots of different needs around the school, now, every now and again, someone will ask me to take on a, a pupil with EAL, maybe to teach them um, an SQA, a Scottish Qualifications Authority course, National 4, National 5, for example, have been some of my recent experiences, um, and to help them to gain 
you know, recognised qualifications um, in English in a manner which is suited to them. Because, of course, you know, it's much more challenging for an EAL pupil, pupil with EAL, you know, to go straight into a, an English language mainstream class and start learning about, you know, the, the poetry of Shakespeare and idiomatic language and all of these different things. Because, you know, being so new to the language, they, they need a different approach. And that's what the SQA ESOL courses are, are all about, really. Um, and, um, I've, you know, I've, as I say, I've supported quite a number of, of, of these pupils at, into, over time. Um, so, yes, so if if at the end of our presentation today, our, our chat today, uh, you know, any of you want any links to any of these organisations I've mentioned, you know, um, resource booklets, which are to do with supporting these pupils, um, academic projects, which are to do with 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 supporting them as well. You know, I, I can you know um, easily put that information straight to, to Stella or to Donna uh, for, for dissemination, if, that, if that's helpful. Um, but, you know, the case studies that I wanted to uh, mention are really things to do with um, some of the pupils that I've worked with over the years, really. Um, one of them is goes right back to the sort of very beginning of my teaching career in, in, in Aberdeenshire, when, <laughs> bizarrely, and, and Sarah Jane will remember this as well, we were really sort of one person departments. Um, trying to provide support across a very big isolated rural area and my, my first case study is really uh, to do with um, Fraserburgh Academy in the very far north of um, the very far northeast corner of Aberdeenshire so uh, and I think the fact that it's quite an, an isolated part of Scotland is, is quite important here um, because like I say myself and, and later Sarah Jane I think you know we were really the only members of staff with a, a background and in working with pupils from other countries, you know, teaching English to, to, to speakers of other languages, that sort of thing, in, in, a, in a world where there was, no, there was no provision, where nothing had been set up. Um, there were, wasn't necessarily much in the way of resources. I think we were kind of creating our own resources to try and support the pupils. Um, I think the staff in the schools didn't really know what it was we did. Um, we might have been working with the other types of support teachers in the school, support for learning, additional support needs teachers, as it were. But we were really in quite an isolated position. And I remember back in the very early days, and some of you will remember this, um, in the sort of the, the mid to late 90s, it wasn't even Aberdeenshire, was it? It was Grampian education, which encompassed Aberdeen City, what is now Murray, and Aberdeenshire. Now, I don't know if you can picture that in your head as, as a map, but that is a huge area, absolutely huge. And there was one member of staff, I think two for a little while, Sarah Jane and myself, gradually others came on board. But um, the re only resources that I had available to me were in the city of Aberdeen, at least an hour away from where I lived. And that would be maybe some, uh, you know, some paper, some stationery, one or two suit exercise books, that sort of thing. And... <laughs> You know, you can imagine that I didn't didn't manage to get to these these resource bases very often. Um, and one of the very interesting things that we did to sort of get, or I did to get around this, was I used the the, the pupils themselves to help me uh, to sort of create resources and that sort of thing. And one of them that I'm very proud of is are the um, the word books that I put together with some of the pupils I worked with in the early days. This is a young lady called Agnesi, who was Latvian, as I think you can possibly see. And she and I put together a Latvian word book, you know, and I put together some illustrations and she told me how to, uh, you know, how to how to, um, you know, uh, name items in the classroom, how to, you know, say various things in, um, you know, to do with maths and to do with English in, 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 in Latvian and that sort of thing. And we put together these, this little resource book, not just in Latvian, but in, in, in Polish, I think, and in, Lith in Lithuanian and various other languages too. And it was just a way of um, helping the pupils work with me and develop some resources and develop some, some materials that might be useful for other pupils who, who, who'd come after and for the teachers to use in schools and that sort of thing. But one of the most interesting things about my early days in Fraserburgh was the fact that a couple of the pupils that I worked with um, really picked up the English of the playground really, really quickly. Not the English of the classroom particularly, but the English of the playground. 
and it and it, it wasn't it's not standard English by any means. I mean, you know, you know what the language well, across Scotland there are multiple accents. The language of Northern Aberdeenshire, the the accent of rural of rural Aberdeenshire, Northern Aberdeenshire is very very strong. And I remember a couple of pupils that I worked with, very confident um, socially really wanted to fit in and I think this is the key they really wanted to fit in with their peers so they developed a very very strong local accent and and fitted in and, and soon became almost indistinguishable uh, from you know the the, the, the local pupils within, within the school in Aberdeenshire but they weren't particularly picking up the sort of more formalized language of the of the classroom because to them to these quite sociable pupils who wanted to fit in that wasn't so important. What was important to them was the social was the social side, was being part of a group, was fitting in, being able to sort of, you know, link in with their peers and get and get on. And one and at least one of them then moved to a different part of Scotland, speaking only the local kind of dialect of this one part of Scotland. So presumably he he would have had to relearn all his the local dialect words to, to wherever it was he went to. I can't remember where, where it was he went to. But I always thought that was an absolutely fascinating thing um, because, you know, it's 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 not a, it's not about being able to sort of ask politely, you know, um, you know, where where the toilet is. It's not about being able to ask politely uh, if you can go and sharpen your pencil. It's about, you know, getting the survival language, I think, of being able to fit in with your, your peers, like I say. Um, so, as I say, I myself and my colleagues here, you know, we've traveled around lots of parts of this very rural area. We've collaborated with teachers and other staff in primary and secondary schools working in classes. So sometimes we'd be working in the class with the class teacher. But sometimes, and this is interesting, we'd be withdrawing the pupils out of the classroom and working with them individually to try and support them with developing their English language skills. And that 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 led to a whole um, other sort of set of, of, of challenges, I guess. Uh, you know, for me, one of those challenges was, you know, where 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 do you work with the pupil? You know, let alone what are you trying to achieve and what are you doing with them? Because as, as I've said, really, the advice now is to immerse the pupil in a supportive uh, language rich environment within the classroom, let alone the fact that they're being taken away from their their peers and their developing friendships. But no, nonetheless, that was the way that in some cases we were asked to work. I had to be very careful, for example, if it was a female pupil, as a male member of staff, particularly, I had to be careful of where I was working on my own with a female pupil. So I had to sort of think very quite hard about oh, where, where's a neutral place in the school, which is not going to lead to any you know, misunderstandings. And normally the library um, was, was one of the, the, the most neutral places where there were other, at least other people around. And, you know, well, obviously for cultural reasons, for religious reasons and so forth, you know, inappropriate for a female pupil to be on their own with 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 a male who's not a member of their family or their husband anyway. You know, so there were there were all these kind of things that you had to be quite careful of. But of course, working within a classroom, supporting the class teacher, you know, could lead to its own challenges. You know, after all, you're working in somebody else's space, aren't you? You know, you're working in someone else's environment and they've got their way of working. They may not really want somebody else on their turf, as it were, but they know they need the support for the pupil and they've got to kind of marry these two things together. And I always thought that 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 was, you know, could be a bit challenging for some members of staff. And I don't know if Sarah Jane and Sylvia will, will ha have their own sort of stories like this, but but I've certainly got one or two. And another one I've got is um, working in, rur in isolated rural parts of Aberdeenshire, like Huntley. Um, you've left your home. The sun is shining the weather's clear you drive an hour to the west or an hour to the north you're in the middle of a snowstorm and that has happened to me many times because of the localized weather and I've had to sort of stand up in the middle of a, a staff room before the end of the school day and saying look I'm sorry that the snow's hammering down here I'm going to need to go <laughs> otherwise I'm not going to not going to get home and the, the other members of staff say you, you can't go the school day hasn't ended and I say I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm going to go otherwise I'm not going to get home alive and my little car bump, and I still remember my little car bumping through snowdrifts and just about making it home, and so so on. Um, so I think the sort of the travelling around the, the isolated rural area, the logistics of trying to visit as many pupils as possible, but you know, like I say, the you know you've got to fit travelling time into that, and you've got to hope that your car will last the distance as well. But you've also got to negotiate your way into all these different school settings, and they're all different, and not all teachers. As I say, 
really want to have another teacher working with them or alongside them. Some do, some don't. It just depends. And you had to do quite a lot of negotiating to try to, to work it out. Uh, Stella, can I stop, stop myself from talking now and say, how are we doing for time in terms of me? Because I'm aware that we want to give Sylvia a chance to, and Sarah Jane. Yes, uh, I mean, we have uh, till our Q&A uh, around 40, 45 minutes, so. OK, 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 so well, well, I'll, I'll talk for another sort of five, 10 minutes and wrap mm -hmm. up if that's OK, and then I'll pass it on. Is that, is that OK? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't want to overstay, I don't want to overstay my time because I'm aware. Yeah, OK, thank that's you. Good. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of draw things to a close with um, three or four just, just I promise just short case studies from my more recent time uh, working with EAL pupils. Um, I'm going I'm going to go actually to one that's really quite recent. Um, I'm going to go to one that's that's only a year or two old um, and it's really a, it's really a success story actually a bit, um, apart from anything else. Um, I work in additional support needs. I'm a teacher of a, a like a hub class of seven or eight pupils with really quite significant needs some of them. Um, you know, autism, Down syndrome, visual impairment, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm not sure who decided this. It wasn't maybe the right decision given this, my setting, but two um, first year uh, Ukrainian pupils were, were placed into my class, not so much for uh, teaching, but for break times and, and for lunch times. Now, I've said already that really the AL service would would advise newly arrived EAL pupils to be placed into a language rich environment where they can chat with their peers and develop their language skills that way. And really my classroom, a hub classroom with a, a few pupils, some of whom had reasonably significant needs, that's not really the right place for, for that to happen. But what was right for them was the fact that it was a quiet and safe and you know, just a pleasant place to sit and spend break time and lunch time when they didn't really know the school, they didn't really know people, didn't really know how things worked. And because I only have a few pupils and I've got assistance, support assistants within the classroom, these support assistants were able to go and find them a snack to eat for break time. They were able to take them along to the dining hall and get them some lunch and bring them back. The assistants were also able to sit and play maybe a little card game with them, you know, Snap or Uno or just something fairly straightforward, not too language intensive, but just something that would kind of get them playing a nice relaxed game in a group and joining in and, and starting to feel that they had somewhere that they belonged. Um, and gradually we started sort of to reach out to other people in the school and see who else could help here and what could we do to support these two new people who so were quite, you know, as I say, unfamiliar with English, unfamiliar with the country and culture, quite anxious and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, what could we do to help them? Turns out the husband of one of my colleagues in the support department was a Russian speaker. This gentleman came down and he would spend break times chatting to the pupils in Russian, Ukrainian, you know, and Russian being, you know, um, the, 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 the most Ukrainian pupils will, will, sp will speak some Russian as well. So that, so now they're hearing someone speaking a language which which they're familiar with even that that makes the situation even better for them i guess and um it turns out that the the, the boy at least um was very very good at the card games and he swiftly became far better than any of us and he would beat his hands down you know and this is this was without hardly using a word of english but his understanding was developing quite quickly because he was out and about in his mainstream classes as well um anyway that was about a year a year and a half ago I haven't seen them since because their English, their English has developed to such an extent that they're no longer, as far as I'm aware at least, they're no longer requiring um, direct support from anyone within the school and they're now purely within mainstream. So, you know, perhaps we were part of, you know, helping them to settle in initially. I would like to think so. Um, and uh, I see them occasionally in the corridors and they just say hello and, and I think they're doing absolutely fine as far as I can tell. Um, I've got two more for you. They're very short and I, I promise I'll finish after this. One of them is a, a, a very tragic story, actually. Um, this is a pupil I worked with just before I went away on secondment. He was from Tanzania. Uh, so he was a Swahili speaker and I would work with him on uh, National 5 ESOL. So that's one of the, the SQA courses. And we would work in the library and 
that would be a good place because there would be other people around, you know, other people we could get advice from the, the, the skills development Scotland person, the careers development person, that sort of thing. And of course, the librarian herself, she was there. So we could we'd get books about this and that and chat about this and that. Um, but unfortunately, while I was away in secondment, I heard that he'd, he had tragically passed away uh, in, in back in Tanzania. Um, and so all of a sudden, my, my work with him came to came to a sudden end. Um, but I always I'll always remember him because, you know, we, the two of us had built up a good relationship. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but he was from Tanzania. I was born in Tanzania, so we had a bit of common ground and he would tell me a little bit about his holidays to, to Tanzania and all that kind of thing. And some of them would be places that I'd recognised. Um, so so his tragic early death, you know, it, it's affected the whole school really quite, quite, quite deeply. But, um, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, at, at, at the time, you know, we, we, we had a, we had a good relationship. And my other little final story um, is is actually to do with someone from Malaysia. Um, and I, I used to work in Malaysia, and so I speak a little bit of the local language. And when this young man arrived first in the school, I was able to use along with alongside his mum, I was able to use a little bit of Malay to help him with the, the initial kind of interview, the initial kind of assessment to find out what kind of um, schooling he'd had before and what kind of uh, what, what, his, what his English levels were like, what other things he'd been learning and that sort of thing. And I always remember him, you know, teaching me one or two um, sayings in Malay and all this kind of thing. And, and the two of us building up a bit of a rapport because of that. So I think my, the point about my last two case studies is that, speaking personally at least, I think if, if you can find some common ground with the pupils you're working with, you know, a common interest or something shared, maybe the two of you like drawing. So the two, I mean, I love drawing, so I would happily sit and, and draw beside a pupil. Maybe they like drawing too. And even without the language link between you, you know, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a common activity that you can you can undertake. You know, music is another one. Music's a very international thing and you can sing a song in a foreign language, can't you, without without understanding what all the words mean. And and you know, that's that's another way into sort of breaking the ice. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I think formal language, formal English language learning, formal learning is not always the way to go to support these pupils. I think that you need other things, maybe go and do some cooking with them in the school kitchen and, and help them to make a sandwich or, 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 or a cup of tea or something like that, or take them for a walk outside and, and, and then you can start learning the, learning the names of some of the plants and flowers and this kind of thing. But, you know, perhaps not, not necessarily that what we would think about as formalised learning. Um, anyway, those, ladies and gentlemen, are some of my experiences from being an EAL teacher and an ASM teacher uh, and really that's me, so thank you very much for listening. That's great, Tom. I have so many notes <laughs> and questions, but I'll uh, I'll wait. Uh, do we have um, another care study or uh, shall we continue with um, Sarah Jane, perhaps? I, 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 I think I think I think I've that I think that's me. Thank you, Stella. Thanks. Sarah Jane, hello, and uh, nice meeting you. We would like Thank to you. hear your, uh, you know, about your experience and your thoughts okay. around this topic. Um, if you'd like to tell me when to stop, I'm, I don't know how much time I'm going to fill. <laughs> yes, don't worry, you have plenty of time. I'll, I'll okay. let you know five minutes before we end the session. Thank Not you. Not the session, the, the presentation time. But, yes, okay. Um, well, I'm um, qualified as a primary teacher, so... Um, all of the support I've, um, most of the support uh, I've been given is in a primary school. Uh, so I'll, that's what I'll mostly talk about. Um, as Tom said uh, in the beginning, when I, when I started working in EAL, I had 15 pupils in five schools. And uh, at that time, um, there were two other teachers working as well and that covered the whole of this area so although as Tom said it's a very large area at that time the numbers were quite low um, obviously a lot has changed since then um, and uh, we've at, at that time I was able to give my pupils two hours a week on two separate occasions and now I'm only able to give them one a week and sometimes not even that much, depending on where they are and how I'm going to reach them. So that's the way things have changed. And we have a team 
we probably have a team of about 13, but we don't all work full time uh, now. OK, so um, I'll, I work um, in three different ways, as Tom mentioned. There's team teaching um, and working in small groups and also one to one. And, and we'll try, I'll try uh, to explain what, why we do which one. Um, uh, so mostly um, I'm working with child, children who are newly arrived, so their levels of English are very small, um, low. Um, but I'm also working with a few pupils, as Tom mentioned, who have other learning difficulties. Um, and I tend to support them for longer uh, because it's a process of working out what actually the other difficulties are and identifying them. Um, so first of all, um, team teaching. Um, I've worked with teachers team teaching, um, particularly with writing. So if I can structure my timetable in a way that's convenient to both me and a teacher, we can, my, my hour can be um, in the classroom, team teaching, writing. So the teacher would do all the planning and would give me the plan for the for the lesson. And I would take a group within the class um, and the group um, where where I've done this mostly is a, a school in Peterhead um, where there was a percentage of 70 um, 70 percent bilingual learners in the school. So most of the pupils in the class were bilingual. Now that's by no means normal in Aberdeenshire. That's very unusual, but it's in Peterhead, they're particularly high numbers. Um, so I would work with my group, but that meant that all all the um, all the introduction of the of the subject um, and of the the lesson was done by the class teacher, and then I would work with my group. So the the plan could be different differentiated to enable the pupils um, to access what everybody was doing, and that's obviously the aim of team teaching, um, just enabling that uh, differentiation. Um, I often work with small groups um, and that would be um, usually around reading. Um, so I would uh, my, I would obviously target my pupil and the group that they were reading with. And that group could be the mainstream children or it might be other EAL learners or a mixture of the two. Um, we always advise um, when children arrive that even though they might not have good understanding, they often have good reading skills because they would have learned to read and write in their previous schools in their, uh, in their home country. And so technically their reading might be quite good but their understanding is often a lot lower. So it's good for them to be placed in a group um, where they would aspire to end up. <laughs> so not, not placing them with children who are really struggling because they need to hear a good model of reading. So we would be working um, on helping them understand what they're reading. In a group, then they're hearing a model um, from each of the other pupils and then we can talk about what's going on in the story and they can hear the voices of their peers and that enables them to build up relationships as well and it enables their peers to understand where the barrier is for them. Uh, not, not that they're unable, they're perfectly able pupils, they just need to be um, they need their words explained to them so they understand. And that helps building up relationships between the pu their peers. Um, if you're just teaching one to one with reading, then the, the pupil may only hear their own voice with all its difficulties or your voice if you take it in turns with reading. Um, and that's not that's not always such a good model. It's good if the children can hear other children reading. 
also, as Tom mentioned, accent is a big issue. And as you can hear, I don't have a Scottish accent. Um, but the children are hearing Scottish accent all the time. So they need to hear the what the how their peers are speaking for their understanding. Um, you know, it's not it's not always useful for me for me to be able to to um be the model because um sometimes they just don't understand a word that I've said um in my English accent compared to the Scottish version which they've heard and recognized. Um which is very interesting, <laughs> very interesting situation. But then so they need to hear what they hear every day, and I'm not often that. Um, the times when I would work one to one is either with a child who obviously has some other barrier, and I'm trying to find out what that is. So I, in my own mind, of decided or feel that EAL is not the main barrier or is not the only barrier. Um, children can learn English very quickly. They became they become social socially fluent, almost socially fluent within a year. But the academic language is a much bigger barrier. Um, and if a if a pupil isn't progressing the way in my experience, they usually do, usually being able to be independent in a classroom after a year, understanding all the basic instructions and, and have a good grasp of language so they can ask questions and find out answers and, and be really quite independent, even if they're not quite working at the level of the rest of the class. But where children aren't able to do this, where they're not reaching those targets, um, it's obvious there might be some other interference. And sometimes, as Tom says, that might be a form of dyslexia. Sometimes it's to do with uh, word processing um, and we need to um, we need to uh, do a first language assessment to see what the level of, the, of their first language is. If maybe they're immature and they're not speaking at a level that that would be the norm for their language, then they're not going to be speaking at the normal level in English either. So the, the basic principle is whatever they can do in their first language, they should be able to do in English. But if there's a barrier, it will be in both languages. And often a first language assessment helps us to um, uh, pinpoint that. If the child is very fluent in their first language, um, and and they're able to read and write in their first language and there seems to be no barrier, then it must be EAL. <laughs> but usually when we do the first language um, assessment, that, that proves not to be the case. Um, so that's when I would work one-to-one -one where I'm really doing a bit of investigation and finding out what they can do and what what the difficulties are. Sometimes it might be with mem memory or retention of of um, of of learning, um, and sometimes it might be uh, being on the spectrum. Um, but obviously, I'm not an expert in those things. But I know I can say this is what it isn't, and ask for others to help me find out what it is. And when when we've confirmed what the what the bigger barrier is, then I no longer need to be supporting because there's something else there that needs uh, an expert. Um, so those are my three little case studies, if you like, not on specific pupils. Um, I thought I'd like to mention also that um, a big part of our work at the moment and and since really since uh, um, the beginning of the war in Syria is has been working with refugees. Um, so we have Syrian refugees and we also have Ukrainian refugees. And so um, I was asked to take a kind of lead on the on the on the support of Syrian refugees when they started coming. So I did a lot of training on recognizing trauma. 
Um, and uh, it's it's obviously going to be trauma is obviously going to be another barrier to learning any, anything. Um, so it's important to be able to recognize it and recognize the symptoms. And for some children, it's it's really obvious. And others, it's a bit more difficult. I have to say that in general, um, most of the children that I've been supporting are really resilient and they're not showing any signs of trauma. I, I do understand that sometimes that can come later. Um, but but there were, I'll just give you an example of one boy who, who came and now he was um, uh, enrolled into primary one when he arrived and he had an older sister who was in primary three. Um, when they arrived from Syria, they didn't come directly from Syria. All of our refugees have come actually not from refugee camps, but from countries like um, Jordan or Egypt, um, where they may have been living um, sort of not quite on the street, but not in very good circumstances at all. Um, and then been been able to get registered as refugees and come to this country. So, so although these children might not have suffered trauma from war you know um they they certainly have suffered trauma from their parents trauma and anxiety and also from really quite difficult learning con uh, living conditions um so this little boy he he seemed okay at first he joined the primary one class but he was very, very sleepy and very, very listless. And he, he would often go away in a corner and just go to sleep. And we talked to his parents and they said, well, he, he sleeps at home. It's not, he, there's no reason for him to be tired. Um, and in the, in the end, we thought, you know, because he wasn't able to learn at all, or he, he was just, almost hiding himself away by curling up and going to sleep and I think that I think that's what it was so we decided that we would um put him into nursery instead now he wasn't really the age to be deferred he was of primary one age but we thought if we just put him into nursery for maybe a term then that would help him to uh settle in learn a little bit of language and of course learning through play although that's what what they have in in primary one in the nursery it's much more free so he can he can decide where he wants to play and who he wants to play with and he did actually settle in really well um in in nursery and that really helped him it also helped him that he didn't have to go in for the full day but just for half a day um, and that was gradually built up, but it didn't really um, end up in him going back into primary one. It took a long time for him to settle down um, and he needed a lot of play. Um, he was very unresponsive and um, he didn't really start speaking until the second term. So he stayed in primary one and in the end, uh, he's he's still a year behind and now he's in primary six but he's his English is at the level with the rest of the children his learning is at the level with the rest of the children and that obviously was the right solution because he just needed that year that extra year to settle and work himself into uh, being comfortable Sorry, Jane, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, just to mention that's right. quickly, uh, like around four minutes, OK? OK, well, very, very briefly, um, uh, as part of my research, um, because Tom asked me to speak about that, um, I, I, I've done the um, diploma in EAL and my work-based learning unit was um, with early years. So um, I worked with early years children that's nursery up to primary uh, one and possibly even primary two um working with particularly nursery teachers 
and SREM practitioners and um, primary ones to work um, to to create some training for for um, nursery workers. So I've done a lot of training with with um, with nursery practitioners and primary primary one teachers, um, just focusing on strategies that will enable children to learn English um, because we don't we aren't able to support children in nursery or in primary one and because most of the activities most of the learning is through play activities that's really what they need to be doing so it's appropriate that they they uh, they don't get withdrawn from that they need to be with their peers as Tom said um, and as part of that I've developed a a handbook for early years called Helpful Hints, which has been endorsed by the Early Years magazine. So if anyone is interested in seeing that, if anyone thinks that that might be useful for their schools or their setting, um, then um, I can give you a, a copy, <laughs> if you like, a PDF for, of it. OK, that's me. Hey, that's great, Sarah Jane. And if you can uh, share it with us, we can share it with uh, with our members and the attendees today here. Okay. Um, thanks very much for all these, uh, you know, uh, interesting experiences. And um, again, I have several points here written down, but I don't want to take time now from uh, Sylvia. I know you've got some points to present as well, right? Thank so, you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Thank you. So uh, let's continue with this, and then, uh, as I said earlier, we can continue with our discussion afterwards. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Tom was talking about the caveats of the dog. I have the caveat of kids coming. Maybe if they <laughs> burst here, sorry about that. No they <laughs> maybe sit <city> left. <laughs> so it's, they are just on their own there. So hopefully, finger crossed, they've been quite good till now. But I'm jinxing it. Um, thank you for having me. Um, as Sarah Jane said, uh, we are a team now of 13 people, kind of. Um, full-time people, part-time, um, and we all work in a different way, a different area. So it's it's interesting the changes into the inside the same team. Um, I am originally a secondary teacher. I, I was a secondary teacher teaching English as a foreign language when I, I was in Spain, and then I moved here and started working as a modern language teacher. And then I, I moved to the EAL in Aberdeen for two years, and then now in the American for more than 10 years now. So um, the way we work, I, I work mainly in secondaries, but I work in primaries too. I support nurseries too, and I also support families. Um, when, when I have my, I was pregnant and I have my kids, I realized there was a vacuum as well when supporting families, bilingual families, um, and then after doing the postgraduate, I my research was on that, on how we support family, uh, families and bilingual families. And I, I'm a firm believer that if we support families from the start, we get less problems in the long run when the children go to school and, and primaries and secondaries and all that. Um, but today, um, apart from, from my introduction, I wanted to speak a wee bit about the silent period and how we do the, how we support students uh, when they had a silent period. Stella, I have a, a PowerPoint. You want me to show the PowerPoint? Yeah, I just yes, uh, share share my screen here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it works. My computer's been updating all day, so I don't know what's going on here, but hopefully it works. Um, I think this is it. Hopefully you can see it. It's preparing the slides. Yes, perfect. Um, can you see it? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. So far, so good. I won't jinx it. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I don't know if you are familiar with the term silent period, but this term uh, was uh, uh, proposed by Krashen. Um, Krashen is one of the gurus of bilingualism, and um, he defined this as the pre-production stage of um, learning of early learning of foreign language learning, second language learning. 
Um, and these this, uh, are unable to, unwilling to speak um, develop or developing the second language because they need time to listen and they need time to 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 just proceed the uh, process the information. Um, Russian uh, gave us different different um, stages of of the language of the of the silent period, the pre-production, temporary phase, the duration, and the importance of it. Um, I'm not gonna. I, I will share with with you, so I don't stop and and, and spend time on this, so you can have this. Um, but what I, I want to focus on on this uh, presentation is the the case study I did some years ago, and um, why I did this is because usually when 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 you get a new student and they they don't have a word of English, uh, the teachers panic a lot, uh, and this is the they press the panic button and they always call you right away. And um, I don't know why they panic. Maybe it's because obviously they don't have any. They they need to speak to to the students and and they don't have any feedback because they don't they don't know the language. Or maybe it's it's just uh, they think that they are not doing enough, or or they don't understand some of the the teachers we we have in Scotland. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, maybe they they don't speak another language, so they don't understand the process of learning a language. So they they they, they don't know that you need a time to absorb and 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 understand the language first before producing any output. Um, so I I have um, the case study was three cases I I, I cover. Um, I could share with you the videos anytime I, I got permission to share this in educational purposes. Um, but it was an interview about these two mainly mainly two and then the third one came after uh, two cases that were string cases. One was Stefania. Uh, she was Romanian and she she was in in record time silent period almost. No, even weeks. Um, another student was Rainers that um, got the other stream of the of the timeline, and he was almost two years in the silent period. So imagine having a child in your class that doesn't speak a word of English for two years. Um, you panic. You think you're not doing good things good enough because the the, the student is not is not um, replying. You don't have any feedback from the student. So it was interesting to see these two and why. Uh, so my interviews to these two students basically was asking questions about what did you feel? Why did you, why couldn't you say a word in English? What was stopping you from talking? All these things. So so the questions to, to Stefania were, were this. And she said um, that there was a before and after in her life. And that's when she decides she had to speak. Because when she arrived, she was speaking Romanian to everybody. And she thought people understood Romanian, but obviously uh, she did. Nobody understood Romanian. And the before and after, and she let me explain this, um, and she allowed me to 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 explain this. And she was she went to the she was in primary, and she went to the toilet, and she farted in the toilet, <laughs> and somebody laughed in the toilet because she heard the fart. And she went back to the class and she tried to explain to the teacher what happened. But the teacher thought, oh, poor girl with, this, with the symbols and the signs. Maybe she, her tummy was not feeling great. So she phoned mom. So mom collected her from school and she left the class. So, and the following day, she came back to class and asked, what happened to you? What, what, are you feeling better? And mom was laughing and said, no, she wasn't feeling wrong. She just... This is what happened as she explained the process. Uh, and so she was so mortified that um, she said, I need to speak English. I cannot this, this happen again because this is mortifying. People don't understand me and they sent me home. And uh, that was nothing wrong with me. So that was the trigger for her to speak English. So she said that the first month she started with survival English. She just decided she had to speak. Uh, the second month was the social play. And and then little by little, she understood more and more and more. She started repeating things that people were saying in the playground or in the class. And she she got a social English like that and she started speaking right away. So the silent period lasted days, 
pretty much after that incident in the toilet. On the contrary, I had rainers that didn't speak for two years, and every time I visit the school, everybody was worried about rainers, everybody was worried, and nobody, nobody was understanding what was happening to him. And finally, after two years, he spoke. And I remember very well, it was before summer, I went to visit the school, and they said, yeah, yeah, Rainer's talking. And just ask him whatever you want. He's going to talk to you now. He's even throwing stones to the to the cars, and he's like a, 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 a revolution in his, his little mind. So Rainer was very introverted. He was like our grandpa in a body of a, of a primary one boy with glasses, um, very, very introverted. Here comes Maclavete Puerta. And um and so he 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 I asked him what happened. He said he was just very shy. He just was scared of people. And he didn't he was scared of committing mistakes. He was scared of, of people judging him. So he was just shy. So he, he needed more time to to be the perfect boy speaking in, in English. So we knew that nothing happened to him like in terms of he spoke Latvian to mom, so he was not deaf. He was, you know, he just, he needed time to speak English. So his silent period was longer and longer and longer because he he was pointing at people. He was grabbing people. He was using sounds. Uh, he was hungry. He was saying yum, yum. Uh, so we, we knew that he could hear us. It was just he needed more time to process the information. Um, but... That was the two contrasts. One was very extroverted. She decided I need to talk. The other case was, no, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not perfect. I, I need to, to have more time. And that's our advice we give to teachers with silent period. First, don't panic. First, second, just give them time. Sometimes we have four skills. So we have listening, writing, speaking, and, and, and reading. Uh, promote the the ones you receive information, which is called input. So uh, input through reading. If you don't know how to read, somebody can read to you. And listening a lot. Could, and listening could be listening to people, listening to songs, listening to a story, listening to a podcast, anything that means listening. Um, some teachers are very skeptical about this. They don't understand that this is the process. And some people take a, a week. Some people take up to two years. So it's an interesting case. The silent period is a very interesting one because everybody panicked about it. And then the third case was Sabrina. She had learning difficulties. Uh, she had problems when she was born. And even though she was in secondary, uh, her brain was the age of a primary child. Um, but because she was so extroverted, she didn't care. So even her severe learning difficulties were there. She, she didn't have silent period at all. She just spoke, whatever. And also, um, there are some factors uh, or some, some different, uh, um, yeah, different um, kind of features that depends, it, it matters when, when you're talking about silent period. So the personality, as we said with Rainer San, Stefania and Sabrina, Age, they say there's some research and studies about uh, the younger they are, maybe it takes longer in the silent period. Um, gender, they say females speak um, more and earlier than men, obviously, the exceptions. And nationality, uh, Sabrina was Italian. I have that with Italian and Spanish people that we are, I think, uh, maybe we are just, we are loud and we, are, we speak a lot, we speak fast. And maybe you have a Japanese or a Chinese, they are more introverted, they are culturally different. So that makes a difference too in terms of silent period. And just uh, to finish this, um, I asked them about uh, tips they could give to teachers about uh, what happened when you were in the silent period. And, and they, they said that they understood mostly everything, but they didn't know what to say. It's like they didn't have the words. So I don't know if you have that experience of of traveling abroad, that you understand the locals, but you don't know what to say because you don't have the vocabulary. So they felt like that. And um, another tip, the the oh, and something they said when I interviewed them was they like, be be visual. The visuals, the images helped a lot. And um, be patient. Give them thinking time and don't patronize them. They they are not stupid. They are not silly. It's just they need time. Um, so that was one of the best advice both of them, Stefania and Rainers, gave me. Uh, just give us time and we will develop uh, language. 
Um, and that, that was it. Um, and you have any questions you want to discuss anything um, later, I'm happy to answer any questions. That was great, Sylvia. Thank you very much. And uh, very your, last, your last point, um, yes, I was thinking that sometimes we have this uh, kind of impression, perhaps, or assumption is the right word, that because um, a student doesn't know, know the language or they, they can't still understand it yet, for example, mm -hmm. that they, they will, you know, they won't do well in other subjects as well. And mm -hmm. that's not the case because you may have uh, mm -hmm. uh, children who are, uh, for example, brilliant in mathematics or physics mm -hmm. and other subjects. It's just that maybe they need time to learn this new mm -hmm. language in order yeah. to. Um, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Thanks very much. I, I will uh, let uh, Donna facilitate the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. Hi everyone, um, Sylvia. If you could just stop sharing your slides, that would be really yeah. that would and be helpful. We can, and we can also stop have, the recording now. I will just um, stop the recording now. Mm -hmm. And what we'd like you to do is just um, offer, kind of, open up now to the the mm -hmm. wider group. If 